The central desert is a vast desert 200 million years later. Its surface is an inhospitable environment, but life has adapted to survive the extreme temperatures and lack of water. It is a wilderness of drifting sand seas, sun-cracked stones and shattered gravel. Unbearable extremes of heat and dryness combine to produce the most hostile living conditions. There are no clouds and the summer sun sears the bare rocks and sand so that temperatures reach a withering 50 degrees Celsius in the daytime. At night, the accumulated heat is radiated away to the frosty sky and temperatures dive to a bitter minus 30 degrees Celsius. In winter, parts of the northern interior are colder than Earth's surface has ever been. Such are the conditions for life at the heart of the continent. The most remote areas of the central desert have not seen rain for hundreds of years, so where is the water that is essential for life? This region was once covered by warm, shallow seas, formed when sea levels were high and the climate was temperate. Gradually, as the continents piled into on another, the land was uplifted and the shallow seas drained off into deep ocean basins, Rain filtered into the limestone and created a sprawling labyrinth of limestone caves deep below the central desert. At the edge of the desert, constant rain drenches the seaward mountain slopes and soaks into the strata, eventually seeping into the porous limestone of the mainland. Over time, this water fills the subterranean reservoirs that lie below the central desert, giving life to the barren wastes above. The animals and plants that exist in this arid land are true specialists, experts in enduring extremes of temperature, they survive through the single-minded pursuit of water. The most successful living creatures in the central desert are insects. For 600 million years, their remarkable adaptability has enabled them to survive the most extreme conditions and weather out all the great mass extinctions the planet has suffered. More than any other living animal, insects are able to diversify into and exploit any number of ecological niches. In the hostile environment of the central desert, insects have found a way to create their own living conditions. The sunburnt surface of the central desert belies the labyrinth of limestone caves and water-filled fists. Years beneath, they stay the same temperature all year, and stretch for thousands of kilometers beneath the desert. To explore this hidden world, it is necessary to look in more detail at its formation. The limestone deposits are a relic of the reefs and muds of the shallow seas that once existed here. As the continents collided, the land rose up, displacing the shallow seas and compressing the mud's reefs into solid stone. Limestone is made up of the shelly debris of marine life and is easily eroded and dissolved by acids in the groundwater. The action of these acids initially creates small pores but, over time, larger caves can result. Despite the acidity of the water and the total lack of sunlight, one group of animal has flourished, polychaetes, a class of segmented annelid worms also known as bristleworms. Normally all life derives indirectly from sunlight, plants convert carbon dioxide and water into food using the energy of the sun, plant-eating animals eat this food and are in turn eaten by carnivorous predators, in the darkness of the caverns, this does not apply. Instead, the initial energy is derived from chemicals, bioluminescent bacteria break down sulfur compounds in the rocks and grow on the energy released, forming an incrustation on the cave walls. Throughout this complex social structure there seems to be a single, corporate intelligence that understands the requirements of the whole colony. The colony functions as though it were a single organism, its whole truly greater than the sum of its parts. The terabyte is a species of eusocial insect native to the central desert of Pangaea II in 200 million AD. A terabyte colony lives in a large tower, about 2 meters tall, which they build, and is composed of a number of different castes, each with its own role to play. Terabytes are descended from termites, one of nature's great survivors, which easily made it through the 100 million AD mass extinction and developed an even more extreme caste system, as well as more advanced chemical weapons. A more recent ancestor of the terabytes lived in what would become central desert before conditions became so inhospitable. In those days, pools of water were more common, and a kind of green algae floris. Head on the surface of these pools, fed on by the terabytes' ancestors. As conditions worsen, 
the oases disappeared and aquifers sank further below the surface, so the terabytes' ancestors began to burrow down to reach the algae and bring it to the surface to photosynthesize. Eventually, in the terabytes, this would develop into a full-scale farming operation. The various castes of terabytes all have different appearances, but most follow the same basic body plan. Only the transporter caste has functional legs, the others have vestigial legs, or none whatsoever. Several castes including gum spitters and rock borers have disproportionately large heads, giving them more room to generate their chemical weapons. Most terabyte castes have internal chemical factories allowing them to generate a wide variety of chemical weapons and tools. Some chemicals secreted by different terabyte castes are acid-based, others are glue or gum-like, and still more function similarly to cement. Terabyte society has rigorously defined roles for every individual, all terabytes are divided into biologically distinct castes, each of which has an important role to play. As they are legless, most of the castes are carried from place to place by transporter terabytes. The founder of a terabyte colony is the constantly reproducing queen, who spends her life in one of the underground nests. Terabytes are highly territorial and aggressive. Terabytes are herbivorous animals, and subsist on a type of green algae which is found on the surfaces of oases, and on the bodies of garden worms. To gather algae, terabyte war parties often march towards nearby pools, where they immobilize garden worms and cut the algae out of their flesh. This algae is farmed and grown by the terabytes in the greenhouses of the towers they live in. Although there are rare pools of surface water in the central desert, terabytes draw most of their water from the underground reservoirs below the desert. To accomplish this, members of rock boring and biting castes dig tunnels to the reservoirs, and water carriers fill themselves with water which they expel when they are transported back to the tower. Terabytes farm a variety of green algae found in the central desert in their towers, using it as nourishment for the WH. Old colony Although they are herbivorous animals terabytes must attack garden worms to obtain the green algae in the first place as it grows on the worm's fleshy lobes to get the algae terabyte gum spitters immobilize the worm whilst transporters cut off pieces of its algae-filled flesh a process which does not seriously harm the worm garden worms are not entirely defenseless however and like the terabytes they can secrete a natural chemicalone which dissolves the glue spat by warriors allowing them to escape. Terabyte towers which may be several feet high are constructed by the builder cast and are made of sand grains the remains of dead terabyte sand feces the particles of which are all cemented together by a special chemical secreted by the builders a single city of terabyte towers may be built over hundreds of years. Below the externally visible terabyte tower is a labyrinthine system of tunnels and caves hundreds of meters deep will dug out by the rock borers and biters these caves house the terabytes nests and are home to the queen whilst the tunnels lead to the subterranean reservoirs from where the terabytes draw their water. The above-ground stories are a brilliantly engineered greenhouse farm running down the middle of the tower as a pole supporting several circular platforms on which green algae grows the top of the tower is filled with small windows made out of transparent polymer allowing daylight to shine into the structure and onto the algae the heat from the sun evaporates water in specially constructed wells at the base of the tower cooling the atmosphere inside and causing a convection effect when the air falls circulating carbon dioxide rich air through to the tower the combination of sunlight and carbon Carbon dioxide provides ideal conditions for the algae to grow and photosynthesize. At daybreak garden worms come slithering out of the fissures in the rock and spread themselves out to catch the rays of the rising sun they hump up their middle sections and begin to unfurl green fern-like tissues that branch and fan out from the segments of its body. The garden worm is a species of photosynthetic amphibious bristle worm native to the central desert of Pangaea II in 200 million AD. Fours, greater than it has a symbiotic relationship with a variety of green algae, which provides it with a constant food source on its own body. The garden worm is one of a number of polychaetes endemic to the central desert, and belongs to the family Phylobranchidae. The garden worm is descended from a marine bristle worm of the family Trichobranchidae which became trapped in a system of underground reservoirs when the shallow sea was displaced by the formation of Pangaea II and became the central desert. This single worm flourished and diversified into several families, including that of the garden worm, which seems to be the only central desert polychaete which ever leaves the caverns. The garden worm is about 45 cm long and some 3.5 cm high. It generally resembles a very large segmented worm, 
with a large number of short, stubby legs, a pair of short horny projections above its two compound eyes, its most distinguishing feature is several long, fleshy lobes running down each side of its body, all of which are packed with algae, which turns them green. Other parts of its body, including its face and areas of its back, are also stained green by algae. The algal growths and green coloration make the whole animal resemble a sort of strange plant. It is capable of secreting a chemical dissolvent from between its segments, which is able to dissolve terabyte glue, and a foul-smelling or tasting liquid which repels other animals when secreted in water. The garden worm is semi-aquatic and a fast swimmer, and lives mainly in the subterranean reservoirs which are scattered beneath the central desert. The garden worm's symbiotic relationship with algae means that it never has to seek out its own food, the algae growing in its lobes provides it with all the nutrients it needs. However, in order for the algae to photosynthesize, garden worms must spend a large amount of time each day basking in the sun on the desert surface. When basking, they raise their midsections off the ground by almost half their own length, then unfurl and fan out their algal tendrils. The garden worm has a very close symbiotic relationship with a variety of green algae, which grows inside the fleshy lobes running along the garden worm's sides. The algae creates food from nothing but air, water, and sunlight. T. Allowing the garden worm to survive in the harsh environment of the central desert. The relationship also benefits the algae, allowing it to photosynthesize when the garden worms bask in the sun for exactly that purpose. Garden worms are also important for terabytes, which harvest the green algae and farm it as their own food source. A special terabyte cast, the gum spitter or warrior, has developed to incapacitate basking garden worms whilst transporters harvest the algae a process which does not seriously harm the worm. Garden worms are able to dissolve the restrictive glue shot by terabytes by secreting their dissolvent. Another animal which hunts garden worms is the slick ribbon, another aquatic polychaete found in the subterranean caverns. The acidic secretions of the garden worm may also be used to repel these predators. The green bacterial meadows of the underground pools are grazed by the gloomworm. The gloomworm is a species of bacteriophagic aquatic bristleworm endemic to the underground reservoirs below the central desert of Pangaea II in 200 million AD. The gloomworm is one of a number of polychaetes endemic to the central desert, and belongs to the family Bacteriophagidae. The gloomworm is descended from a marine bristleworm of the family Trichobranchidae, which became trapped in a system of underground reservoirs when the shallow sea was displaced by the formation of Pangaea II and became the central desert. This single worm flourished and diversified into several families, including that of the gloomworm. Half a meter long animals which travel in groups. Gloomworms feed exclusively on a kind of bacteria which grows on the walls of the caverns below the central desert, and are themselves preyed upon by slick ribbons. The slick ribbon is a fearsome predator. Its jaws are mounted on an extendable trunk that snaps out at passing prey. The slick ribbon is a species of predatory aquatic bristleworm endemic to the underground reservoirs below the central desert of Pangaea II in 200 million AD. It is one of a number of polychaetes endemic to these reservoirs, where it is the apex predator. It belongs to the family Megaphosidae. The slick ribbon is descended from marine bristleworms of the family Trichobranchidae, which became trapped in a system of underground caverns when the shallow sea was displaced by the formation of Pangaea II and became the central desert, this single worm flourished and diversified into several families, including that of the slick ribbon. The slick ribbon grows to about a meter in length, and, like the garden worm, has a long, segmented body. It has a large number of paddles running down the sides of its body, one pair to each segment, accompanied by adjacent bristles which detect changes in water pressure. It has an unusual head structure, with stocked eyes, two ambiguous plumes projecting from either side of its head, and a large mouth with two powerful pincers mounted on a long, extendable trunk. The slick ribbon's mouth and tusks are not visible or usable until it extends its trunk to catch prey. The slick ribbon is an aquatic predator which catches its prey by snapping out its long, extendable trunk mouth. It is a swift swimmer, with its multitude of paddles beating in a wave-like action almost like an aquatic millipede but it is not as agile as its cousin the garden worm. As the apex predator of the caverns, slick ribbons will hunt other polychaete worms including gloomworms and garden worms. 
Gloomworms are defenseless, but the larger and more nutritious garden worms, which are not always present in the caverns, can put up a fight against slick ribbons by secreting a disgusting chemical into the water.